This monstrosity is a face rig, and if you want to animate your character's face, you have to fit this animatronic looking skeleton inside the head of your model, and then to animate your character you have to move and rotate each of these bones. What if instead you were able to make different facial expressions by either sculpting or modeling your character's face, and then using something like this to pick and choose the expression? This isn't anything new by the way, this is how 2D animation has been done for years. The artist would pick the expression they want for the given line of dialogue or action, and then keyframe that expression and move on to the next one. It doesn't need to be complicated, so why do we overcomplicate it in 3D? I personally never want to make another face rig again, so I'll show you how to do this in Blender. This method will work best on stylized characters that have more cartoony proportions. It will also work for realistic characters, but the more choppy animation style won't look as good on a realistic model. First off, pick a character you want to animate, or if you want, go and download my practice model for free. The link's in the description. Once you have your character, we need to pick some facial expressions that we want to model. To keep it simple, for this I'll be modeling three expressions, happy, scared, and angry. Combined with the neutral expression, that gives us four. We're going to break up the expressions into three different categories, so we want the eyebrows, eyes, and mouth to be separate controls. That way we can combine them together to get different expressions. We're going to create the expressions using shape keys, and if you don't know what they are, shape keys are a way of storing different versions of our model, and then using the shape key sliders, we can turn up or down the effect of these different versions, allowing us to play around with expressions. The shape keys just store the new positions of all of the vertices, and then we blend from the base shape to the new shape. Let's start off with the eyebrows, because they're the easiest. With your model selected, go to the data tab, and create a new shape key by pressing the plus icon twice. The first time you click it, it will create the basis shape key, which should be the most neutral state of your character, and then we can add another one and name it eyebrows angry. Increase the value of this to 1, and this will allow us to see what we're doing. So this is the eyebrows angry expression. You can use sculpt mode or model it in edit mode, but all you need to do is give your character angry eyebrows by pulling down the inner part of the eyebrow. If you're in edit mode, enable the x-axis mirror and proportional editing to make your life easier. I prefer using edit mode because using proportional editing and turning on the connected setting means that I can move the skin without worrying about messing up any other parts of the mesh, like the eyes or teeth. The most important thing here is that we're only affecting the eyebrows. The eyes and mouth will be handled separately, so don't make any changes to them. Feel free to get as creative as you want with the eyebrows, but this is what I ended up with. That's one, now let's do eyebrows sad. Create another shape key, turn the angry eyebrows down to zero, and for this one you'll be ringing the inner corners of the eyebrows up. Spend as much time on these as you want, making sure to get references instead of trying to do it from memory. Once the sad eyebrows are done, add the raised shape key and make your happy eyebrows. I'm not going to waste too much time here, just model the eyebrows and then we're done with this step. Once you're finished with that, your shape keys should look something like this. I try to create a blank shape key to act as a label because sometimes you can get lost when there's hundreds of shape keys, but you can also move them up or down to organize them. The eyebrows are now done, we just need to do the exact same process for the eyes and mouth. I'll let you do this at your own pace, but just pay attention to the shapes and make sure you're not overlapping other areas. With more stylized characters, feel free to exaggerate as much as you want. The beauty of the shape keys is that we can come back and change these at any time if we're not happy with them. For the eyes here, I really pushed the scared eyes, making them huge and shrinking down the pupil to give that cartoony look. Also, I'm changing the eyelashes by shaping them to remove some of the points. With traditional 2D animation, the character is very rarely drawn exactly the same way. Sometimes an artist might miss an eyelash or make the eye a slightly different shape, so we should try to replicate that in 3D. Also, for the mouth, try and break the symmetry a bit. Give your character a crooked smile and see how it looks. You'll also see in my practice model that I have black faces all around the lips. We can use these to our advantage to give the lips an outline to really strengthen the shape of them. Again, these are all shape keys, so nothing we're doing here is permanent. If you're not happy with it, keep on playing with it until it looks right, or start again if you need to. Once you're finished with the eyes and mouth, your shape keys should look something like this. Go ahead and play around with it a bit, turn up and down the different shapes and create some unique expressions. Even though we only made 3 of each expression, that gives us a total of over 20 unique combinations. Now comes the fun part, where we can start hooking up all of the shape keys to our images. You can get fancy by rendering out close-ups of the different parts of your model, or just take screenshots, or you can use the sample ones that I've made, again, link in the description. This is the part of the video where we're going to get a bit more technical, because we need to be very specific with everything we do from now on. The way this method works is that we calculate the distance to the nearest image from our selector object. When the distance is zero, it means we are directly on top of the image, and in that case we want the value of the shape key to be 1. 
If we then move away from the image, the distance will increase, and so the value of the shape key should decrease. We can do this using a distance driver on our shape keys. It sounds more complicated than it is, but basically when we're above the image, the shape key should be on, and when we're off the image, the shape key should be off. You can hide everything in your scene or move it to a new collection to keep everything neat and tidy. If your cursor isn't at the world origin, press Shift S and reset it. Now using the Import Images as Planes add-on, select all of the images for the mouth category. You can change the shading to shadeless so it doesn't cast a shadow or get affected by lights in your scene. Now we can add our first selector to the scene. Create a new object to be used as your selector. This can be anything you want, a cube, a sphere, a monkey, or if you want, you can append the one that I've made. You'll find it in the files you downloaded. With your selector added, we want to add a few constraints so that we can only move it on the X and Z axis. With the object selected, go to the Object Constraints tab and add the Limit Location constraint. For Limit Location, enable the checkbox for both Minimum and Maximum Y and make sure that it's set to zero. Also change the owner to local space. Now the only thing we can do with our object is move it on a 2D plane. We can't move it on the Y axis. This just makes sure that the selector always stays in front of the images. While we're here, with the object selected, you can press F2 and rename it to Mouth Selector. We also want it to snap to the grid, and to do this, we can do a little bit of playing around with drivers. Go to the Object Data tab, right-click the X location, and add a driver. A new window will pop up, but just click off it for now. Expand the bottom window and change it to the driver window. You'll see your X location driver on the left and a diagonal line. This right here is our driver. To navigate this window, use the middle mouse button to move and control and middle mouse wheel to zoom on either axis. Pressing numpad period or choosing view frame selected will zoom directly to the center of the graph. I'll explain more about the drivers later, but for now, let's just get the object to snap to the grid. Select the driver on the left-hand side, then back on the right-hand side of the window, you'll see a few tabs have appeared. Open the Drivers tab and expand it if you need to. At the very top, we can see it says Scripted Expression. Scripted Expression means that we can actually do some formulas to calculate the value for the driver. For this one, we'll keep it fairly simple, so just change this to Round, Open Brackets, Var, Close Brackets. Just a side note, Blender is made with the Python programming language, so round is just a maths function that rounds any number to the nearest whole number. The variable that this function is referring to is listed below. These variables can be anything, but in this case, it's a transform. What we want to do is use the X location of the selector itself and then round that number so that it's always a whole number, meaning it will snap to the center of each image. Underneath the object field, choose your selector object, then change the space to transform space. Now if you move your selector, you'll see it's snapping along the x-axis, but it's still moving freely along the z-axis. So repeat the same process for the z location, add the driver, and this time, we'll be using the z location for the driver transform. Now our selector is snapping to the grid, and we can't move it along the y-axis. Let's now add a parent object so we can move around all of our images and selectors at the one time. I'll make mine a text object, and this will act as a header for our category. So just type in mouth, and parent the images and the selector to the text with Control p Now we can move the text off to the side and bring back our character. Now it's time to add some drivers. Our text is quite big, so we can scale it down and move it near the head. And because we set the snapping drivers to transform space, our selector will still snap correctly even though it's smaller. Now select your character and go back to the shape keys. We only have the mouth selector for now, so we can add the mouth drivers first. All you have to do is right-click on the number beside the shape key and add a driver. A window will pop up, just ignore it. These are all settings that we'll be changing later in the driver window. If you did that correctly, the number should turn purple. In Blender, any field that is purple means that it is being controlled by a driver. Do this for all three mouth expressions. In the driver window, you should now see a list of your three drivers. If you zoom in close enough, you'll see that there are two points, one at 0, 0 and the other at 1, 1. These are the default values for the driver, and we'll be changing these in a second. To make it easier to work with though, we can hide some of the drivers by clicking the eye icons on the left. Hide two of them, we only just want to work with one for now. To explain a bit more about what the driver is actually doing, I've set up this example. As I just mentioned, those two points in the bottom window are actually keyframes, and these keyframes have values that you can see in the F curve tab on the right hand side. To visualize this a bit better, I've just added a driver to the X location of this cube, so that I can move it with this slider. So at a value of zero, the cube moves to an X location of zero. 
and at 1, it moves to an x location of 1. What happens if I change this? Let's say instead of moving 1 meter at 1, we move it 10 meters. Now when we increase our slider, the cube moves 10 meters, even though the slider is only moving from 0 to 1. We can also move, rotate, and scale these keyframes like any other object. So what happens if we rotate the points in the driver window or scale them? Now our cube starts off at 0. As we increase the value, it goes up to about 15 meters and then back to 10. But our slider is only moving between 0 and 1. So the whole idea behind drivers is that we give it an input, in this case our slider, and then the driver uses the input to calculate the output, the location of the cube. Let's go back to our character. In the driver window, select the driver and in the drivers tab on the right hand side, this time instead of rounding the variable, we can just leave it as var. We can change the type of this variable to distance, and now we have to choose two objects, the first being our selector and the second being our image. Make sure you choose the matching image for your chosen shape key and change both inputs to transform space. Select the first point and in the F curve tab on the right, make sure that the keyframe is at zero and the value is at one. Select the next point, make sure it's set to a value of one and zero. Your driver graph should now look something like this. To prove that it works, move the selector back and forth and you should see your expression change. Now we just need to do this same process for the other mouth expressions. Repeat this same process for the other two mouth expressions, making sure to choose the correct image and that your distance driver is set to transform space. If you have any problems, go back to the drivers tab and make sure that the expression is just var and that your variable also has the same name. Sometimes it might have a number added to it and that'll cause problems. With that done, now you can move your mouth selector back and forth and it will change the expression. If you want to see what it looks like without the snapping, you can go back to the selector's drivers and get rid of the rounding. Now when you move the object, it blends smoothly between the shape keys. The beauty of doing this with a distance driver is that we can actually move around our images to get different blends. The driver is just calculating the distance between the images, so you can reorder this in any way you like. Some of the transitions don't look great, but we can move around the images until we find some nice blends. I do really like some of the in-between expressions, so instead of just rounding the position to the nearest whole number, we can use this formula to round it to the nearest half. Now we can snap to these in-between transitions without having to try and position it manually to get the perfect value. If you want, try out some smaller increments, like rounding it to thirds or quarters. That'll give you some more in-between expressions to choose from. I know this whole process takes a little bit of setup, but I would much rather this than having to worry about weight painting a face and moving bones to create expressions. So hopefully now you know the process. Add another selector for the eyes and add your constraints to the selector. Add the drivers to the shape keys, Edit the drivers so that they use the distance between the images and the eye selector. Then make sure to set the keyframe values for the drivers. So at a distance of zero, the shape key is set to one. And at a distance of one, the shape key is set to zero. With all of the drivers set up, you should have something that looks like this. At this point, you probably want to start animating your face. Change your driver window back to the timeline and just click the record button above the timeline. This will keyframe values anytime that we move our object. So go to frame one, select your expression and it'll keyframe the object for you. Now move forward a few frames and choose another expression, maybe a blink or a smile, have fun with it. Now if we play our animation, you'll see the selectors move around and your character should be blending between expressions. The selector will move directly from one position to the next, so at some points it might have to jump over other expressions which will activate them, so you might just need to change some keyframes around to avoid any unwanted expressions. In cartoony animation, the face expressions don't always smoothly blend, they jump from one expression to the next, and that's what this method is perfect for. If you wanted to use this for realistic animation, it might not work as well as you wanted because of the blending. Anyway, I hope this method helps with animating your character's faces. I know how much of a pain it is to use the face rig, so hopefully this method makes face animation more accessible to everyone. Thanks for watching.